Brilliant. And we are live. Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, everyone's got their coffee, everyone's got their breakfast, everyone's ready to learn something today, maybe. Welcome. Um, welcome to Born Social Presents, Social Media in the Crisis. For those of you that don't know, um, we are Born Social. Born Social are a creative led social media agency based out of Shoreditch in London. We're not currently in Shoreditch, as you can imagine. We're based in sort of various locations around central and greater London. Um, and Born Social Presents is normally, it's our quarterly opportunity to produce a piece of thinking um, and a piece of research on the wider industry in social that is particularly pertinent or interesting to our clients. Now, as you can imagine, when we begun discussing what our content for our latest Born Social Presents uh, session was going to be, it didn't take us particularly long to decide on the topic. Um, and I think as you can all imagine in the current situation, um, you can understand exactly why. Now, we go back two or three weeks, maybe three and a half weeks even, when the lockdown began. We had a huge number of um, clients and businesses coming and speaking with us um, about quite a few sort of very specific questions. Um, we know that we work with businesses in the e-commerce sector, in the retail sector, insurance, fintech, um, B2B, you name it. And all of these businesses are experiencing effects and problems um, in a huge number of ways. Um, and even though they all work in incredibly different areas, we saw questions coming from sort of three broad categories. Firstly, what the hell is going on? What's going on in social? What does it mean for consumers? What is behavior looking like? What are my competitors doing? Um, what, is, what is just what is going on? Secondly, we saw questions around what the hell is going to happen. If, if consumer behavior is changing, if my competitors are all suddenly pivoting and shifting, what the hell is going to be happening on the platforms and in social in the next two weeks, three weeks, or even the next two or three months? And finally, perhaps most importantly, what the hell can I do? What does this mean for my content pipeline? Um, what does it mean for content production? What does it mean for um, my industry? And we found ourselves doing what we always do when our clients come to us with questions, and that's doing some thinking. So we put the strategy team's task um, to develop a piece of thinking, a piece of um, content written and titled Social Media in the Crisis. Um, it went down incredibly well. We sought to address a number of these questions, also talk about what was good and what other brands were doing really well. Um, and not only did it go very well, down very well with our clients, but as we began to share it with a few friends, friends of the agency, um, they also were pretty thankful and happy with what we produced. So what we realized and what we felt was more important than producing our normal white paper, our normally quarterly white paper, was to produce, uh, was to open up this presentation, open up this content to a much wider audience. Um, amazingly, right now, we think we've got close to a thousand people signed up to the event today. Um, we're so excited to be sharing this with you. What we're going to be doing and what we have been doing since the initial social media and the crisis presentation is we've been producing two or three more more pieces of thinking a week uh, particularly on more specialist areas and more specific pieces of content we really want to be sharing some of that with you guys as well everyone that signed up to today's event are um, now on a mailing list and we'll be sharing our three pieces of work a week in a newsletter for you but please do um, feel free to share um, share the email shout at one social with KDK with anyone who might be interested and get them to sign up to our follow-up events. We're going to keep pushing these out every two weeks and keep trying to help people have an understanding and have a grasp of what the hell's going on in social and what they can do about it. Now, I mentioned those three questions at the top. What is going on? What's going to happen? What can I do about it? I'm not going to be here to answer those questions for you today. Uh, luckily, I have got two of our experts and two of the original creators of this content. Callum, our strategy director, and Essie, our senior strategist. I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. Um, they are going to, from an admin perspective, talk hopefully for the next 35, 40 minutes, covering those major three topics which I mentioned. Whilst that is going on, I'm aware I would love to have open questions like our normal events. Um, there are a huge number of you at the moment, but what you will see is in the bottom hand of the screen on your Zoom link, there is a Q&A 
button. If you click on the Q&A button, you can whack a question in there, you can do it anonymously or as your name, feel free. Um, I will then vet these questions throughout the presentation. Hopefully when we've got about 15 minutes at the end, if you need to rush off to another call video meeting, go ahead, jump out. We're gonna field some of those questions that people have asked. I'm hoping and expecting there's probably gonna be a lot more questions than we can deal with. So please do be aware that we will try to get back to every single one of you. Um, I will collate all the questions. If they're anonymous, just drop us an email to shout at bornsocial.co.uk and we will get back to every single one of you. We are also, just a point to note, running, we've got little slots um, of the strategy team's time, 20 minutes at a time. Over the next couple of weeks, between now and the next event, just email shout at bornsocial.co.uk and we'll look to book you in one of those slots and we can have a slightly more personal conversation about some of the challenges you're experiencing or if you have just any questions of what we talked about today or in looking for any sources of information, anything like that. Um, last point from me is that we will be hosting another one of these events in two weeks time so keep your eyes peeled um, in your inbox and you'll be getting an invite soon. Please share around to anyone that you think might be interested. That's all from me. I will now hand over to Callum, who's going to kick us off today. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks so many people for joining. Uh, awesome to see so many of you. Um, really excited to run through uh, what we've got today. Um, the past few weeks have been pretty crazy um, from, from our perspective, and I'm sure they have been for you as well. Um, we have uh, kind of seen a complete reversal in everything that we thought we knew about how marketing works, how social works, how the world works. Um, and it's caused us to um, kind of go into overdrive with our thinking, trying to make sense of this new world. Um, and what we are really like, uh, kind of excited to share this morning is some of the highlights of that thinking. Um, so we just kind of want to help uh, make a bit of sense of what this new world looks like um, because it is drastically different. Um, so, you know, we're now living in a pretty serious global crisis, that much is clear, um, the likes of which we've never seen before. Um, and this has caused um, significant behavioural shifts. I can't think of another time where we've seen um, such a drastic change in behaviour in such a short amount of time. Um, just really um, kind of, sorry to use the word, but unprecedented. Um, and on a lighter point of view, um, it's been quite, uh, I guess, warming. Uh, the kind of lighter side of it is, is, is that we're all living through this together. Um, and what that has meant is that we've got these uh, kind of shared understandings of what lockdown life looks like. Um, these quarantine cliches are popping up everywhere. I'm mainly D about to branching to C. Um, I'm sure everyone can identify one of these, um, but we've got these new ways of living um, that we're all adapting to in these strange times. Um, and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, working in marketing, sometimes you can be, feel a bit self-conscious about even talking about advertising or marketing at the moment. It feels like there's much more important things to be, to be stress, stressing on at the moment. But I saw this quote from Mark Richardson, which I thought was... Um, quite apt and kind of changed my perspective on that. Um, it might seem superficially mercantile to discuss brands, pricing and customer behaviour as we stare down the barrel of a pandemic, but the practical reality of global economic trade means that we need to market now for the good of all mankind. Uh, quite grandiose, quite a big statement. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, we need to be marketing, we need to be thinking about brands uh, to try and kind of get back to normality, which we're all so much craving. Um, and you know, we couple that with the, the proven perils of going dark um, as we kind of um, kind of drift into this now seeming looming recession. Um, so much evidence has been created around um, the perils of, of going dark, reducing spend um, and going quiet as a brand. It just really is quite a dangerous thing to do if you can avoid it at all. Um, it's so important to keep leaning into to, to marketing, advertising, getting your brand out there in these times. Um, which just makes it kind of crucial to get it right. So um, when we think about what we wanted to run through this morning, um, we were quite keen to um, almost uh, use this as a turning point. So um, for us, at least, I'm sure it's the same for you. Um, you spent the last few weeks uh, trying to kind of, uh, in a state of panic, um, trying to kind of adapt and pivot what you're making, how you're making it, trying to get 
kind of uh, get stuff out that, that still makes sense. Um, so we're going to take a look at that. Um, we are going to almost summarise what we've learned in these last few weeks. Uh, we're going to take a look at how social has changed and then Essie is going to run us through what that has meant for brands, like what are the, the new rules of engagement, what, what has worked and, and how should brands be approaching this um, and kind of uh, give a check on the state of play. Uh, but then we're really keen to shift the conversation into tomorrow. Um, you know, everyone's talking about what the new normal looks like. Truth is, like, no one really knows. Um, but what we can do is we can give a bit of a view on what we're seeing at the moment, like what do we think is going to stick around, like what is going to be the lasting impact of those shifts and give a bit of a view again for how social is going to change long term and what that might mean for brands. Um, so that's the plan for today. We're going to look at both of these things. We're going to look at what today means for social and brands and what tomorrow could look like for social and brands. Um, so let's get cracking. So I uh, wanted to start by looking at social um, because we've seen uh, drastic changes in behaviour. In all my time working social, I've never seen such a quick change in behaviour in, in such a short amount of time, which makes it really interesting, but also really important to understand. Um, and saw this interesting piece of research uh, last week around how the loneliness of the social distancer triggers brain cravings akin to hunger. Um, you know, we're literally craving connection in this time of isolation. Um, and the, the really interesting thing that's happened this time is that those cravings are being uh, almost satisfied through social. Um, over the last few weeks, while, while we're in lockdown, we've seen that people in the UK, 38% uh, of people in the UK are spending more time on social media than they were already. 39% uh, spending more time on messaging services and 31% are watching more online videos. Those stats are from GWI uh, this month. Um, you know, we were all using social a lot before this. We're using it even more now as we look for more ways to connect and more ways to pass the time. Um, and, you know, my, my initial suspicion was that that was uh, concentrated in, in younger age groups, but those gains are consistent across all age groups. This is some research from Kantar uh, last week just showing that these, these gains in usage are consistent across everyone in the UK. Um, so it's a re it really is a changing landscape in terms of the attention. But it's not just, I think the point that I want to get across here, it, it's not just that people are spending more time on social. The big shift we're seeing is that people are using social in very different ways. Um, and I think the thing I've been thinking about here is that uh, for the first five years of social media, um, you know, from 2010 to, to 2015, uh, we were all getting excited about how social media was bringing uh, the social into marketing and advertising. So the promise of connecting with friends, building communities, uh, all that kind of stuff. That was the promise of social that we all got really excited about and all lent into. Um, and then we've seen this interesting shift over the last two, three years, rightfully so. Um, beginning to see social as, as just more of a media channel um, you know actually with the decline of organic reach it, it's better to see social as, as a paid media channel where you can get additional distribution get reach frequency broad audiences all that stuff that, that is kind of uh, traditional advertising um, and that's true for users as well um, you know mindless scrolling passive consumption those are the words that have been used to characterize how people use social um, it's very much more of a, a media space than social. Um, but interestingly, uh, over the last few weeks, um, and I'm sure you agree, it feels like it's drifted way further back into the social side. Um, all the all the kind of original intentions of what social media was was created to do feels like it's coming out again in, in a massive way. Um, you know, it is helping people get connected when they're when they're in isolation. It it is kind of that feeling of community is coming through a lot stronger and it just feels like we're getting back to what social was created to do um, which is just a really interesting shift um, so there's four components to that that we're seeing um, the first one is face-to-face -face. Um, the surge in video chat over the, over the last few weeks has been really interesting to see uh, house party uh, no one was talking about it uh, a month ago now it's uh, overtaken facetime in, in the amount of conversation on social about this app, um, just that casual way to connect with people in video and, and give that kind of intimacy and connection that, that isn't that perhaps possible through, through other social channels. 
but also the unstoppable rise of, of Zoom over the last month. Just crazy figures going from 10 million at the start of the year to 200 million users. Um, even my gran is using Zoom now, which is uh, crazy. Um, but it just the unstoppable rise of this face-to-face -face contact is, is just such a departure from the way that we were using social before, um, all that kind of passive consumption, which is just a really interesting shift. Um, second thing we're seeing is this rising community spirit. Um, the original promise of social was perhaps that it connects you with people outside of your local community, the people that you can't see face-to-face. But actually, we're seeing that during the crisis at the moment, it's been used as a real organising tool for local communities. Um, our street set up a WhatsApp group, unbelievable. Um, you know, in London, like, no one talks to their neighbours, but, but this crisis has brought us together um, and social media tools are being used to organise around this. Um, mutual aid groups are popping up everywhere. Um, the Guardian reported that over a million people in the UK are now a member of, of mutual aid groups for coronavirus, which is astonishing figures really, and just shows the, the power of these uh, community tools, which again are so different to the passive forms of social media that, that we were previously leaning into. Um, virtual participation is a really interesting thing that's been happening. Um, so uh, I'm sure a lot of you have taken part in Zoom quizzes over the last few weeks, um, working out in living rooms with Joe Wicks, um, and even virtual wine tastings through social. Um, this is really interesting because, um, again, to, to hammer the point, social media previously was around watching, consuming, but, but not really acting. All of the activity we're seeing at the moment, or, or a big proportion of it, is around actually taking some kind of an action, getting involved, doing something as a result of what we're seeing on social, whether it's working out, or Zoom quizzes, or wine tasting, or art classes, or learning the guitar. It's all these things that are kind of actual participation, which, which is just a really interesting thing to see. And that's not to say we're not still consuming in a passive way. Um, you know, social media is still a distraction tool, um, but, I think we're getting distracted in a different way as well. Things like live videos, I'm sure, you know, if you've been on Instagram in the last few days or the last few weeks, that top row of stories is almost entirely live video now. Um, and that feels like a more connected way of getting distracted. Um, you know, it's live, it gives you connection and you're in a chat with other people. Um, things like the Netflix uh, View Together feature, just a really interesting uh, piece, watching, Netflix shows getting distracted but doing it at the same time with, as, as other people um, and finally this, this crazy feature from Instagram which is allowing you to uh, s scroll the feed with someone else so you can watch someone else scroll the feed which, which seems absolutely mental but it kind of just plays into that getting distracted but together um, which is a big departure from the passive solo experience of, of before um, so I think when we're thinking about social has changed, it's just interesting to put it through this lens. Social is getting social again. Um, it's in face-to-face, community spirit, virtual participation, and getting distracted together. And, and I, for one, um, really hope that this is a, a trend that sticks around even after we're through this, because I think it's a, a healthier, um, better environment for social. Um, so that's what we're seeing in terms of social. And I'm gonna hand over to Essie, who's gonna take us through what that means for brands. Hey guys. Thanks for joining from me as well. Um, I'm SCM Senior Strategist at Bourne. Um, and welcome to my dining room. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be covering what the today looks like for brands. Essentially, what have we learned from those immediate actions of reacting to the crisis? So now that we are over the initial shock of, you know, reviewing our content that's going out and pausing or reallocating spend, what are the new rules of engagement that have emerged over, over the last couple of weeks? So I'm going to explore three key areas for this. And the first area that I'm gonna look at is this redefined focus on brand and brand values. So there's been a lot of research into the relationship between a brand and consumer in a time of crisis. Um, and what we've learned, I'm sure everyone's seen these reports and uh, research pieces kind of cropping up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but what we've learned is that people need to be able to trust the brand to do what is right. So this is from the Edelman uh, Trust Barometer, um, the report that came out a couple of weeks ago. 
And I think that there's really no better way to show this than lean into your values and consistently exhibit them through your actions as well. Because really, when we think about company values and, and brand values, they are there to provide a guideline for making decisions and kind of help hold ourselves accountable by asking the simple question of, does this decision reflect our values? So does this decision reflect what we set out to do in the beginning? And I think this is going to be a really telling time for, for a lot of brands, um, especially if your values happen to fall within the, the 30 most common company values, as, as you can see here on the right. So I think it's a really telling time of, of brands to consider, you know, what are your brand values? How actionable are they? And do your employees actually know what they are and, and how to act on, act on them as well? So I think it's a really an opportunity for, for brands to, to refocus on their values and through that then maintain or, or increase um, brand trust. The um, other thing that we've understood over the last few weeks um, is that our focus should be on this long-term brand building versus, I guess, aggressive uh, sales activation. So there's a couple of categories that we've seen uh, increase demand for, like online groceries, um, consumer essentials, and kind of those stay-at-home e-commerce categories. They've been in really high demand uh, in the quarantine. And also there have been some categories like high value purchases like white goods for example travel where the purchases have very much been very much been delayed and what we've seen that cause is this decreased competition on social in particular and that's simply due to the fact that there's less players in the field uh, as brands tend to pause their activity in the short run so what we've seen is a drop in both cost per mail and cost per click across most of our clients since, since around mid-March when the crisis, crisis really hit, as you can see here in the graphs as well. So I think it's really important, as Callum already mentioned, not to pause your advertising, but keep on, keep on running it. Um, continue investing in prospecting in particular, turning those cold audiences into warm audiences. People might not be ready to buy at this very moment. As long as we keep building those audiences and kind of build, uh, keep building for, for the long run, uh, we're in a very good place uh, once, this crisis, once this crisis is over. However, I think it's important to remember that those who do continue to advertise throughout, majority of people expect that advertising to make a positive contribution to society. So this is from the Kantar barometer um, that came out in the last couple of weeks as well. So majority of consumers expect the brand to talk about how the brand is helpful in the new everyday life. They expect brand to inform about what they are doing to face the situation. And they expect the brand to offer a reassuring tone. And I think it's also important to remember to be aware of the, the pitfall. Um, consumers think that brands should not exploit the situation to promote their brand. So even if we are continuing that advertising, you need to understand that importance of leaning into brand building in this new context rather than focusing on its pure sales activation um, and obviously can't, can't come across as if we're exploiting the situation in any shape or form. I think an interesting example of when it comes to the brand values is this McDonald's uh, case study that a lot of people have been talking about over the last couple of weeks. So the global McDonald's values, uh, responsible leadership, inclusiveness and progressiveness. So I think this is really a kind of an example that illustrates the importance of understanding the true meaning of your values. Because if you look at these values, and then if you look at the, I guess, the two different content pieces um, that they put out, I think it's pretty clear to see which one of these better represents those values. So I think it's clear that acting on your brand values rather than just representing them or I guess showcasing them or talking about them is so much more important. I'm going to move us on to the second area I'm going to look at, which is supporting your people. So as Cal already explored, there's been this redefined focus on communities. And I believe that brands should very much explore this beyond, beyond social as well. So there's been a huge amount of analysis into the last major recessions and the relationship between brands and, and consumers. And the conclusion is, is pretty clear. It's the brands that focus on customer service and satisfaction throughout these very challenging times 
tend to win, both during and after a recession. So customer experience very much matters at this moment, probably more than ever. And identifying those people who to support is incredibly important at a time like this. So if you're, for example, if you're an alcohol brand, is it the wider drinks industry that you want to support? And um, it could be, is it students across the nation? Or it could also be, you know, your employees. Or sometimes you might need to think a bit more laterally beyond your immediate community and, um, and try to understand, you know, who are these people, people that I need to support during, during the difficult time. And also once you've identified them, then how can you best serve those people? Is it by joining forces with the government? Is it by giving them discounts? Because we know that people don't necessarily have a huge amount, huge amount of money in their pockets at the moment. Or is it just giving them a platform or giving them a voice and so they can have their, they can have their voices heard as well? And I think when you've identified your community, and I guess the appropriate action that you wanna you wanna take, think of how you wanna wanna speak with them. With, we, I think we need to remember that with like this anxiety at an all time high and this massive uncertainty of what comes next, acting with compassion and that showing that support goes a really long way. But when it comes to your tone of comms, I think there's a very fine line between being empathetic and compassionate and just being worthy. And I think this is one of my favorite, favorite tweets from the last couple of weeks. I don't think we need any more uh, long emails from, from company CEOs stating how we're all in this together. So it's just really about finding that, yes, compassionate tone and showing that understanding and support of your people, of your community, but not veering too far down on the, on the worthy side of things. A brand example of this is a campaign that we at Bourne have been working together with Copperbeck. So it's the Together We Can um, campaign that was launched last week to support the wider hospitality industry. So we've identified that Copperbeck's, I guess, community, their people are the wider hospitality industry who are really having a hard time at the moment. And the I guess, mechanic of the campaign is to donate minimum 20 pounds to the licensed trade charity. And then you'll get your hands on a, on a complimentary case of Copperberg as well. And we've raised nearly 10K over the last week of the 25K K overarching goal. So I think it's just a really nice example of, you know, identifying that community and then doing something good, doing something good for them as well. And area number three, that really underpins all the others is the foundation of, of acting before talking. So it's this idea of, of just doing something. And I think it's important to remember that, yes, we might be a couple of weeks in um, into the crisis, but it's really not too late to, to do something. And again, as we look at, I guess, what the consumer expectation is, I think it's really important to know that it's not just to change the way you advertise and talk about your products, but it's really about how brands can make a tangible difference. So these stats are from the Edelman Trust Barometer as well. So almost 90% of people want brands to shift producing products that help people meet the challenges. Again, it's not just about the way you advertise or the way you communicate about your products, but what is it that you produce that, that can help people. They're also expecting brands to partner with government and relief agencies to address the crisis. Again, doing something very tangible to help people and keep the public fully, fully informed regarding how the brand is supporting and protecting their employees and customers. So this idea of you know, protecting, supporting your immediate community is hugely important as well um, when, it comes to, when it comes to understanding, uh, I guess, what your consumers want to see from you. And there's also this question of distribution as well. So we know that both being both mentally and physically available is, is really important to ensure, ensure brand growth. And that brings us to the problem of distribution at a time like this, because we've started seeing delays in delivery and delivery delays in particular have been named as the main I guess, current effect of the pandemic on e-commerce businesses in Europe in particular. So how can you distribute your product in a way that enables everyone in the market to benefit from it? 
I think uh, restaurants have been a really good example for this over the last couple of weeks and a month because they have kind of shifted the, the way that they operate and started providing, you know, takeout. They've come up with a very, like, very quick solution to, to delivery services as well. But we also know that there are so many people out there who are struggling for day-to-day -day necessities. So is there anything that your this product distribution network can do to make a difference? Is there a way, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about LVMH and different brands producing hand sanitizer, for example. You know, is there a way that you can use your distribution network to help others who, who are in need? And what I thought in terms of a brand example, the MS food um, news story that came out, I think last week, of how they're basically supporting their floor staff by giving them a 15% pay rise and for pay furlough staff was a really nice example because we know that consumers expect brands, they choose to look after their employees first and foremost. So this idea of really supporting their immediate employees is so important at a time like this. And also they've added in different branded items to maintain this strong availability during the pandemic as well, essentially making sure that they um, kind of keep that strong element of distribution um, in their shops as well. So I thought that was a really nice uh, example of, of a brand doing something good and the way they communicated about it as well. So from a comms perspective, they produced this piece of piece of content and that was fully filmed on the employees' phones. So they kind of, yes, they, they talked about it, but it was, I guess, okay to do that because they had already acted on it first. So it's a really nice balance of, you know, doing the good thing and then talking about, talking about what they're doing in a wider sense as well. So that was today and what kind of has happened up until now in terms of social and brands. And now we wanted to look at what might happen tomorrow. So I'm first going to cover kind of the social behaviors. And so I'm going to dive into the platform and social trends that I believe will be driving this slightly more lasting change in the landscape. And then I'm going to hand over to Cal, who will look at um, this in terms of brands. But I've got four different areas that I've considered, considered for, for social. And the first one of these is what I call the Facebook roadmap reshape. So over the last couple of weeks, Facebook have quite aggressively shifted their priorities for, for their product development. And that's mainly been done to very rapidly adjust these changing user behavior. And you may say what you say about Facebook. Um, I know it's not everybody's favorite platform, but why I think this is interesting is because it is still one of the most powerful platforms out there. And what Facebook does, the other platforms will very likely mimic at a later stage as well. So if you're looking at what's been happening on Facebook over the last couple of weeks or since the pandemic really started, started globally. In terms of the countries that have been hit hardest by the virus, we can see that total messaging on Facebook apps has increased more than 50% over the last month. And voice and video calling have more than doubled on Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. So there's been a huge amount of interest into these particular, um, I guess, products of the Facebook family. And when you consider what's happened in Italy specifically, um, Instagram and Facebook Live views have apparently doubled in a week. And as this graph shows, um, time in group calling has increased by over a thousand percent during the last month month. So there's this really massive demand for this kind of messenger and um, voice calling properties that, that Facebook, Facebook offers. And what I kind of put together is this illustration of, I guess, their roadmap of how I can imagine that that would have happened. So say Facebook, for example, has um, been focusing on advertising revenue or whatever, whatever their kind of objective has been prior to this. Now, after the immediate outbreak, the, the, I guess the immediate concern was to stop the spread of misinformation about the virus. So that's very similar as the approach on for Twitter, for example. But as soon as that element was up and running, the company started 
building new features. And the entire purpose of those was to help users um, and small businesses affected, affected by the lockdown. And essentially, Facebook started to move towards, I guess, capitalizing on this rising usage of, of people, people being stuck at home. And that's why they focused on live groups and, and messaging. And they've actually been making some pretty big moves in regards to these, these three areas. So last week, I believe it was last week, um, they announced uh, updates to Facebook Live. So including ways that users can actually watch those Facebook live streams without having a Facebook account. And they've also added a Messenger desktop app. So you don't have to use Messenger on your phone, but you can log in via your desktop app for group chats and, and video calls just a couple of days ago. And what's interesting about this, or I guess what is the long-term implication of this, is that Fuji Simon, who's the head of Facebook app, has, um, has mentioned that Facebook will likely prioritize groups, live video, and messaging for the long-term as well. Because as she said, it's a need that exists in times of physical distancing, but it's a need that exists in normal times as well. And, and I would agree, I think, all of these are kind of very human needs, which I think is why we see these particular content formats of live um, messaging and group elements kind of pop up, pop up time and time again. So I believe that, that will, this will kind of change the shape uh, that Facebook will operate in the future as well. Now, moving on to the second area of, of tomorrow, so looking at TikTok, everybody's been talking about, talking about TikTok, I feel like more than ever before over the last few weeks. And they, I think the, the platform itself has really shifted its scope um, over the last few weeks. And I think that might determine how it's viewed in, in the future as well. So if you look at what's, what's happened on TikTok, so there's been a massive boost in usage. So the coronavirus tag, um, has 45 billion views and counting. 20% of Gen Z say that they're spending more time on esports or creating and uploading videos and services such as YouTube or TikTok. And there's just been a massive, almost explosion of interest in how to TikTok. I'd like to know how many of these people are over 30s. Um, but that, so since the beginning of March, people have really become hugely interested in how can I make the most of the platform. And what's been really interesting to, to note from their end is that, you know, at a time when Facebook and, and Twitter are kind of battling misinformation, TikTok has very much focused on a, on a more education and focused approach, which I think is a slightly more I guess, proactive approach as well. So they partnered with the World Health Organization to provide what they call trusted information to our community. And I do believe that these kind of Q&As and, and short snappy snippets of you know, what's going on with the virus and how we should respond to it are actually playing a really big role in educating, especially the under 25s. And it kind of goes a long way in establishing TikTok as a, or establishing themselves as a, as a credible platform as well. Um, but what's even more interesting has been this, um, the recent Happy at Home live stream series. So that was daily live streams with a bunch of different, different celebrities. And what's interesting about this is the fact that, as we know, TikTok has kind of had a bit of a perception problem with the slightly older audience, um, so I'm going to say over 30s. And I think these people have been more inclined to not consider using it because they don't quite get it. And it's quite difficult to get into the platform if you don't know the ins and outs of it. But I think it's really logical for TikTok to be making such a massive investment in, um, I guess, getting these really well-known celebrities to, to broadcast within the app, because that really can go a long way to diversify their audience reach, because then attracting the fans of these celebrities will kind of help push that awareness effort and even potentially branching into different or older audience groups via, via these celebrities. So really this has been a, an opportunity for TikTok to drive their awareness piece across, across different, different demographics. 
So what I think we would expect to see um, is a further increase across these demos in the future. So bringing us back to the, the graph that Callum looked at earlier as well. So if TikTok manages to attract the crowd, and keep them keep them spending so find a way to monetize on the platform as well i think we'll definitely start seeing an increase in these slightly older audience slightly older audience demographics as well now when it comes to i guess the behavior on on social i think traditionally with social content and the length of content the shorter has been better so we all talk about this like snackable distraction content um, that everyone's sharing on social. But now that we've got slightly more time on our hands, we are seeing a shift uh, to kind of consume longer, longer forms of content. So what this means that in China, uh, we've seen a demand for long form content has seen a massive increase since the, the start of the of the pandemic because essentially people are just trying to find new ways to spend time in isolation and as we know the need for entertainment hasn't gone anywhere quite the opposite when you're sitting at home on your own all you want to do is you know just watch some really great long-form content of most likely a tiger king um, but this kind of combined with the cancellations of events and gigs and festivals and concerts, I think organizers are really having to find new ways to, to provide entertainment. And that means that there's been a surge in the supply of kind of long form and live entertainment content on social. So there are players like uh, Time Out who have actually branded themselves as Time In Now, which I think is brilliant, who are providing this advice of you know, what to stream today. So looking at different, I guess, uh, long form content pieces that you can get stuck in while you're stuck at home. And what's interesting about this is that I think historically, loads of event organizers have always really struggled to reach audiences beyond those physically attending. So just even if we think of um, Glastonbury, for example, and the coverage year on year, which is arguably the UK's most, most famous festival. And yes, they do stream the content on TV, but I think there's just so much more that brands could do on social um, around the event. And I think those are the things that we're starting to, starting to learn now. Um, and investment in this like live and entertainment content on social has, has really boomed over the last few weeks. For example, the, um, the National Theatre put, um, put out a play, which I think it reached around, um, or it was watched by over 1 million people one, when it was on its launch night. And um, there's South by Southwest who are releasing their film festival collection on Amazon Prime Video. And Twitch, for example, who are putting, um, putting out this, this Stream 8 uh, fundraising concert um, that's obviously streamed, streamed online. So I think while these long-term implications for festivals and, and cinemas and all of these live events aren't necessarily clear, I think we're seeing a shift that will start shaping the, the social landscape, landscape for good. So as we start to get a better understanding of how to make the most of these live features, I think we'll get much better at kind of, uh, I guess, sharing that audience, yes, with those who are attending the event, but then also those who will be, will be watching it from home as well. And now coming on to the last uh, area, so number five, what I call the positive couch activism. So again, it's around this fact that there's been an increase in activity around communities organizing around a particular course. So we've actually seen an increase in social conversation around neighbors. Uh, so essentially when people come together to, to help those around them. And there's been loads of local efforts in fundraising or distribution of supplies, medical supplies, or even kind of mental health support with, with your neighbors. Um, and I think those have been really key to make sure that these preventative measures are available to everyone, even those who wouldn't necessarily, for one reason or another, um, couldn't get government support, for example. And what I think is really great is that these local neighborhoods or interest communities or creative hubs have very much um, sprung up over the, over the last couple of, couple of weeks. And they're largely using social messaging uh, platforms to, to communicate. So yes, it may have taken a kind of a global pandemic to get more people to do good, which 
isn't that great to begin with. But I think with a bit more time on our hands, we're coming up with really creative solutions to promote social change. And I would like to believe that this has kind of awakened a small activist, at least in, in most of us, and made it realize how easy it is to actually organize and contribute around the cause. Um, and I, I think this is actually a shift that will, that will outlive, outlive the crisis. At least, at least I certainly hope so. So that is all from me looking at the tomorrow for, for social. And I'm going to hand back over to, to Callum, who's going to be looking at uh, brands. Thanks, Essie. Uh, that was awesome. Um, I think what Essie has shown us there is that whatever happens over the next few months, um, I think we're pretty confident that there is going to be lasting change, particularly on social. Um, so I just wanted to finish with a few, a few thoughts about how brands should be thinking about this. Um, this is the conversation that we're having with our clients right now. Kind of, We're over the short term, uh, tweak, adapt. Now it's time to really think about what the long term strategy is because we really do have to reevaluate. Um, so I just want to share some, some kind of parting thoughts on how we're thinking about that with our clients. Um, it is interesting to think about um, the time we're spending in lockdown. Um, and how that might affect kind of behaviours and changes for good. Um, research shows that 66 days um, is the amount of time it takes for a new behaviour to become automatic. Uh, 66 days, two months sounds like it could be the amount of time we're all spending in lockdown maybe longer maybe shorter who knows um but but what that says to me is that um whilst we're all leaning into these new ways of living certainly some of it is is going to stick around in some form washing your hands for 20 seconds like i'm not going to be letting go of that as soon as i'm out of quarantine um so it feels like there is going to be some real behavior change that we have to lean into um, and when you couple that with the, the real importance of getting this right for your, for your brand, um, looking at the, the previous recession in 2008, strong brands recovered nine times faster um, following the 2008 financial crisis. Um, it is so crucial to be getting this stuff right for your brand um, in order to recover quickly. Um, so when we look at those two things, uh, the scale of the change plus the clear importance of getting it right, I think that shows to me that we have real impetus to reevaluate everything. It's not just a short term tweak to, to the content that's going out. It's a real long term uh, reevaluation of what your strategy is, what role social is playing, what you're doing. I think that is what we need to shift the conversation to now. Um, and it's kind of tough to think about how to do that. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, a lot of people talk about this new normal. What is the world going to look like after the pandemic? Truth is, it's very tough to tell. Um, but the way that we have been thinking about it is in sort of like a pendulum, right? So you have the world before the pandemic, what social media looked like before pandemic, and you have the way that we are acting now, the way that we're behaving now, uh, which in many ways is like a, a big swing to the other side. Feels like uh, it would be uh, kind of maybe too far to say that we're going to completely kind of stick with our new behaviors but often the kind of the, the end result is going to be somewhere in the middle we might swing back a bit but you know there will be some kind of behavior change so it's interesting to look at where were we before where are we now what does a middle ground look like between those two things i think that is the best way to think about what this future world is going to look like um so just to bring that to life with three examples uh, just to close um Social media uh, over the past few years has been built on this uh, kind of uh, vision of aspiration. So like jet setting and avocado on toast and sumit lattes, all that kind of stuff, uh, particularly influencers uh, really focusing on that. And, and overnight that has gone from kind of aspirational to almost tone deaf. Like it, it's, it's not good to be talking about that stuff. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't reflect the world we're now living in. Feels like restraint is the new uh, kind of value that we're all leaning into during this time in lockdown. Um, and when we think about what we're going to be looking like after this, uh, it, it doesn't feel right to me to say that we're going to swing right back to this kind of aspirational vision of, of what life should look like. I feel like there is going to be a more conscious form of, of capitalism happening. Um, and I think that there is going to be lasting change. And I think that will affect how brands need to present. The, the lifestyles that their audience should be, should be living. Um, look at social production. Um, for all the talk about, um, you know, social content, social first content, even up until um, the crisis, I, I still feel like 
um, a lot of us do naturally gravitate towards high end, super glossy, uh, very expensive forms of production. Whereas the last few weeks have taught us that someone in their living room uh, with an iPhone can get more reach and impact than, than most brands would ever dream of. I think it's going to be, uh, there is going to be some lasting change from this. It is a bit of a, a wake up call for all of us um, in showing that, um, you know, social first content and uh, not putting tons of resources into production, but getting stuff that works for social is, is like uh, the way to go. Um, and finally, um, to go back to my first point, whereas over the last few years, we've all been drifting into the kind of media side of social. These past few weeks have taught us that social can still be social. You know, this organic community side of, of, of social media is still, there is still something there. And I'd hope to see that once we're out of this, we actually sit somewhere in the middle of these two things. You know, we take all the fundamentals of how social media has, has been, become a real kind of powerful media tool we weave in these kind of social features and actually find this this great middle ground between the two um, so i think that's the way forward um, that is what we wanted to run through today um, i hope that was really helpful um, it's, it's certainly been an interesting time for all of us um, we're going to hand over to ed who's going to kind of uh, round that up Thanks, Cal. Um, and thank you guys for, for listening. Um, we've had loads of questions coming, particularly in the last sort of five minutes, uh, which is awesome. Uh, wanted to save the last 10 minutes or so today to kind of go through some of those live questions, put it to our esteemed panellists uh, and presenters today, see what they think. So I'm just going to put a couple of questions to you guys, get your thoughts on them. One of the first questions we got in, uh, about 10 minutes into the today's presentation was from Victoria. Um, so we are a global B2B event company for the cruise industry. This sector has quite had quite a negative press when it comes to COVID-19. How would you suggest we approach our sales strategy on social platforms in order to be sensitive to this? I guess we could talk about more broadly as well how, how brands can be sensitive to it. Yeah, great. So I think I think what we what we've learned um, is that you really need to stay clear of anything that could be seen as as salesy messaging at, at this time. I think it is the time. You know, we usually talk about a sixty forty split between brand building, emotional messaging, and and forty percent being more rational sales led messaging. I think for now, what we are recommending is going almost a hundred percent on that brand softer messaging. Uh, just purely kind of the long-term stuff because sales messaging is, is just not the stuff to be to be leaning in on right now it, it doesn't feel right to audiences um, and, and you will get pushback from it so i think my opinion would be uh work out what stories you can tell long term um there will be an after after this how can you talk about that um and, and kind of lean completely in on that and, and just don't focus on using social as a sales driving tool at the moment um because it's just not going to be seen in a good line yeah, I totally, totally agree with that as well. Um, I think Skyscanner are an interesting example to look look at at the moment and what they are doing. Obviously, they're not selling any flights at the moment, but um, they are fully focusing on that sort of brand building piece. And really, as I mentioned earlier, is you know going back and identify what are those values uh, that you can talk about at a time like this and how to kind of make sure that, that you're acting on them as well. So yeah, fully, fully agree on, on Carl's point there. Thanks, Essie. Um, and now we have a question from someone who I'm going to apologize now because I think it's Tlo Tlolo, um, but sorry. Um, so on the subject of McDonald's, can you think of any brands that have shown a great use of social media during this time? What are some of your favorite examples? So look, I think some of the work, I'm going to call out some of the work that we've done. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think Callum, you could get a better uh, description of the stuff that we've been doing with um, King's College, for example. Yeah, really good, really good example. So we're, we're working on, um, so King's College are running a, a study into the, um, the mental health implications of the crisis. Um, so, you know, we're all focused on the very physical side of, of coronavirus, the physical health implications. They're running a study into what is going to be the long term mental health implications of, of this crisis. Um, so we're using social as a tool to kind of 
um, allow people to participate in this, to recruit uh, people to take part in the survey. Um, and I think the route we have taken with that is very much uh, trying to feed into this kind of participatory culture. People want to get involved. You know, we've seen that 750,000 people have, have volunteered uh, for the NHS over the last few weeks. And we're trying to tap into that kind of uh, feeling, allow people to show that they're making a difference by taking part in this. Um, and it, it's got a really amazing response so far. Um, so we'll share around the link. Do you take part in the study? It'd be an awesome thing. I think um, that has been a really interesting project to be to be working on. And also, I think on the uh, slightly more entertainment side of things as well, what I really liked is this um, Adidas they run this team, uh, home team campaign at the moment and the evolution that they've kind of seen uh, in relation to the pandemic has that they basically used the, um, the main ambassador for the campaign, who's Jonah Hill, to basically release this almost call to arms for creators out there to you know, use this time really productively to, to create content, whether it's film or music or, or um, you know, poetry, basically to, to make sure that young people are using their time into putting it into something good. I thought that was a really nice evolution from this quite uh, celebrity heavy campaign that we've seen on billboards to turn into something a little bit, um, a little bit more, I guess, social and relevant at, at the time, at a time like this. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, I think we've probably got time for maybe one or two more. Um, I think I've got a couple which are covering quite similar topics. So uh, Malcolm's just written, we're observing the concept of the curve in relation to the pandemic. Do you feel there'll be an emerging kind of content curve in terms of tone, reach and frequency? I think slightly related to that as well, Kate's written a question saying, do you think brands will move away from high production value on social um, long term after the crisis, given how content is being created from homes? Um, I'm not sure what you guys think about that. I think yes to the second second question uh, in particular. So I do think that that brands will start to understand the value of great uh, effective content, regardless of how it's being filmed. I think it's really healthy to to understand that you don't necessarily need a twenty person film crew to create an, an effective piece of content especially if it airs on social and I would really like brands in general to challenge that their prominent view of you know how do we make good content and I, I think it's something that the outlook is something that will stick um, past, past this crisis as well. For sure. I think it'll be a waking up call for, for a lot of brands in terms of how, 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 kind of how you can produce this stuff that will get even more impact than, than the super expensive, super high end stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I can't see us going back to purely the other side. I think we'll sit in the middle of those two things. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we're probably running a bit tight for another question. Um, there are loads coming in. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of questions asking about examples of what good looks like. B2B has come up a few times. Um, other channels like TikTok has come up a few times as well. We put together an entire presentation of examples of content we think is really, really good um, and why we think it's good. Um, I will make sure that in the email follow up to this presentation, that presentation is included. So you can all go through and see that and that should hopefully answer about half of the questions that are coming through. Um, last point from me is thank you so much uh, for joining this morning it's been an absolute blast um, we are as i mentioned going to be hosting one of these events every couple of weeks we're going to tailor the content each week depending on a what changes in the landscape um, but also perhaps some more particularly interesting topics there's a hell of a lot of questions around b2b right now so maybe we can we can might start looking at slightly more specific topics like that um, the email just remind all your friends and colleagues, shout at bornsocial.co.uk, um, drop us your questions there and we'll look to get in touch with you direct or we can book in a 20 minute slot to have a chat. Um, but nothing more to be said from me other than thank you so much for joining. Um, we will get back to all the questions answered directly in the Q&A. Otherwise have an amazing Easter um, and we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks. Thanks everyone.